Hello everyone, this presentation is on infant of diabetic mother. By definition, it is any baby who is born to a gestational diabetic mother or to a mother who is insulin dependent. Characteristically, it is seen as large babies, babies who are plethoric, who have a moon face, hypertrichosis or a hairy pinna. But a large baby is generally synonymous with an IDM baby. Briefly to revise the WHO classification of diabetes, it is classified as type 1 which is insulin dependent, type 2 which is insulin resistance, type 1 is also known as juvenile diabetes previously, type 3 is nothing but gestational diabetes which is a third type and other rarer types which are associated with conditions like cystic fibrosis or which are drug induced. Uh, if you come to incidence wise, 80% of infants of diabetic mother are associated with gestational diabetes and only 3 to 10% of pregnancies are complicated by abnormal glycemic control. These babies are at high risk of perinatal mortality mainly because of the congenital malformations what they do face. Coming to the pathophysiology, this flowchart depicts it in a rather simple way. It is quite easy to understand. Maternal glucose will subside by the action of insulin and there is also a transfer of glucose across the placenta to the fetus. When there is an increase in fetal glucose levels, fetal insulin production is increased. It is important to note that insulin in the fetus does not cross over to insulin in the mother and vice versa. It does not happen. Also the action of the placental hormones helps in increasing maternal insulin levels and to an extent it does help in bringing down maternal glucose. What is important to notice there is hyperinsulinemia in the fetus which is a relative hyperinsulinemia. To explain this a little bit more in detail, fetal hyperinsulinemia will cause beta cell hyperplasia in the fetus which will ultimately result in macrosomia. It can result in birth trauma, it can result in brachial plexus injuries, it can cause a clavicle fracture, it can cause cardiac hypertrophy. Fetal hyperinsulinemia will also cause increased fetal metabolism which causes relative hypoxia which can lead to polycythemia and neonatal jaundice exaggeration. Fetal hyperinsulinism can also cause respiratory distress syndrome because of decreased lung maturity or hypocalcemia because of parathyroid maturation. Uh, being impaired. Hypocalcemia itself leads to jitters in the neonate. Neonatal hypoglycemia also can lead to jitters in the neonate. Apart from all of this, maternal diabetes itself has a risk for increased abortions or stillborn. It also causes renal diseases which can cause small for gestational age baby. That is the opposite end of the spectrum. So we did say that Maternal hyperglycemia leads to fetal hyperinsulinemia which can cause an LGA baby. On the opposite end of the spectrum, it can also cause renal diseases which can cause an SGA baby. So both ends of the spectrum are theoretically possible. It is important to remember that most of the sequel what we know is because of poor maternal glycemic control. That is very very important. If you come to diabetic embryopathy properly, some common defects what we do see are microtia or anatia, that is earlobe deformities as you can see in this image. Midline facial defects like cleft lip, cleft palate are quite common and facial microsomia is also quite common. In this image as you can see there is a cleft lip. The image does not show it but a cleft palate is also there in that baby. Coming to cardiac anomalies, 30% uh, of all IDM babies do have cardiac involvement out of which septal hypertrophy and cardiomyopathy is the most common. However, the recent update does say that transposition of great vessels is more common than septal defects. The incidence is almost 40% as opposed to 33 as per the latest statistics. So transposition of great vessels is more common. In, as a cardiac anomaly which is seen. Apart from that it can be associated with a single ventricle hypoplastic left heart. PDAs are most common in this age group and in this presentation dextrocardia is also occasionally seen. 
if you i'll just zoom in here this does show septal hypertrophy you can see it in this image right here as opposed to the left ventricle uh, this image basically shows the uh, cardiac monitoring being done for an infant or diabetic mother and uh, you can see in this x-ray pretty much the haziness is seen and there is a cardiomyopathy more or less because the cardiac shadows are quite large as opposed to what is expected for this age group. What is seen is that what is expected is more like that in this age group. What is shaded is expected what you see is more or less double the volume almost. If you see the gastrointestinal abnormalities, bowel dysmotility is common. It is also associated with bowel atresia and occasionally with small left colon syndrome. The first CT shows a small left colon syndrome, whereas the second X-ray here shows more or less uh, dysmotility with an increased amount of air bubbles. Coming to skeletal anomalies, the first one what we will discuss is caudal dysplasia which is also known as uh, regression ST. It is very rare with an incidence of only 1 per 25,000 and it is the most specific malformation associated purely with IDM. Sacral agenesis is um, definitely common and it is also associated with the hypoplastic pelvis and other anomalies usually will be there, I am sorry, other malformations will also be there like club foot, bladder extrophy and occasionally uh, femoral hypoplasia as well. This x-ray shows sacral agenesis where uh, you can see the vertebral column going up to L2. You can see the innominate bone shadow but there is no sacrum present. Similarly, caudal regression is seen in this child here. If you come to CNS anomalies, uh, all neural tube defects can be seen pretty much like anencephaly or meningomyocele. Hydrocephalus is common along with uh, holoprosencephaly as well. Uh, this image characteristically shows uh, meningomyosin, a preventable neurotube defect. This child also has advanced stages of anencephaly with a uh, neural tube defect as well. This child has hydrocephalus with a uh, shunt in situ, post-surgical correction. Macrosomia is the most recognized complication of IDM with a uh, definition of large for gestational age, namely being birth weight more than 4 kgs or 90th centile of gestational age. Macrosomia is associated with a good chunk of all IDM babies, pretty much almost 60% associated. And uh, if you see the physical findings, there will be an increased adipose tissue, disproportionate head to shoulder ratio, the baby is likely to be plethoric with an abnormally large placenta and cord as well both. Macrosomia uh, during birth is commonly associated with birth trauma. There is an increased risk of brachial plexus injuries in these uh, children at birth. These children are also associated with an increased risk of birth asphyxia and are likely to require prolonged resuscitation at birth. The other associated risks of course from an obstetric point of view include uh, higher, risk, higher incidence of caesareans, higher uh, incidence of operative vaginal deliveries like use of vacuums, ventus or uh, forceps. This image uh, shows some birth injuries because of macrosomia. Uh, the first one is policeman's tip because of a brachial plexus injury. This x-ray shows a fracture shaft of humerus. This one uh, is a prolonged uh, caput and uh, this posturing is abnormal which is pretty much because of the abnormal uh, abnormality of size which often results in CPD. I did make a mention as the opposite spectrum which comprises of small for gestational age babies which is because of advanced complications because of renal disease. So the opposite spectrum can cause STA babies because of IUGR as you see in this slide. When these children are born because of hyperinsulinemia in the fetus they are at risk for hypoglycemia as a result of which uh, CBG or GRBS monitoring is to be done at regular intervals. The intervals at which this should be done is at birth 
followed by one hour, second hour lay, at the third hour, followed by 6, 12, 24, 48 and 72 hours of life. At any time, if found to be below the operational threshold, correction is to be initiated. If you see the complications of uh, an IDM baby, the most common complication what we all know of is hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia, which is why it is highlighted in red. The other complications include hyperbilirubinemia, polycythemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, cardiomyopathy and respiratory distress, but hypoglycemia remains the most common complication. Moving forward to hypoglycemia, uh, the operational definition as per the latest edition of Cloherty's Manual of Neonatology is a glucose level of less than 45 mg per deciliter. So anything less than 45 is considered as hypoglycemia and does warrant a correction. The treatment of uh, hypoglycemia of course is to uh, initiate early feeds if the baby is stable. But if the baby is not able to feed, it is always advisable to start fluids, immediately secure an IV line and go at 2 ml per kg, uh, slow IV and continue infusion at the rate of 80 to 100 ml per kg per day and in very extreme severe cases to use glucagon as well. Serial glucose monitoring is also to be followed. Before coming to management, uh, one formula which I would like to highlight when it comes to hypoglycemia is that of glucose infusion rate. There is an R. The glucose infusion rate is nothing but the percentage of dextrose what we are following into rate in terms of ml per kg per day divided by 144. This formula is very important. I repeat myself. The glucose infusion rate is nothing but the percentage of dextrose what we are infusing into the rate of fluids in terms of ml per kg per day divided by 144. And it is important to note that the target GIR to be maintained for correcting hypoglycemia in a neonate is between 4 to 6, preferably 6. Coming to the management, uh, the management of an infant or diabetic mother begins in utero. So the delivery is to be timed according with the fetal well-being. Estriol challenge test is to be done along with the oxytocin challenge test. Maternal uh, diabetes is to be managed skillfully and effectively by the obstetrician. And opting for elective LSCS for a large baby if CPD is uh, thought to be a uh, complication to be expected. There is no harm in taking an elective LSCS for such babies. Once these babies are born, early feeding is advised and prophylactic phenobarbitone is sometimes, is sometimes given for preventing hypoglycemia and hyperbilirubinemia, that is neonatal, jo neonatal jaundice. But early feeding, early feeding, early feeding goes a long way. Symptomatic treatment for hypoglycemia is a must along with regular monitoring and routine screening for all congenital anomalies. A routine head to screen toe head to toe screening is done for all babies but a special screening is to be done for infants of diabetic mother and routine cardiac evaluation by a routine 2D screening echo is a must. A screening 2D echo by a pediatric cardiologist can rule out most cardiac anomalies and it is best to be picked up early. On that note I thank you all for listening to this presentation. The purpose of this presentation was to uh, sensitize all of you towards infant of diabetic mother and towards undergraduate medical students from an examination point of view, postgraduate students from a revision point of view. If you are listening to this presentation as a concerned parent, then if you have any further doubts, I strongly recommend you do bring them to the notice of your uh, pediatrician or your child's medical practitioner. This presentation does not replace the advice of a practitioner from a practice perspective. Thank you.